Hello, my friends. My name is Mario Bolivar. I'm the pastor of this congregation, Eustos Presbyterian Church. And today, like most Wednesdays, we gather to read the Bible, to explore Revelation, the book of Apocalypse, uh, a book that has a lot to, to give and to share um, a lot of hesitations and questions. So my, my attempt has been to show you how practical the book of Revelation can be and how applicable it can be to our lives. The book of Revelation to me is not uh, only to speak of the future, but the current reality. Um, for me, the book of Revelation is a book that calls you to repentance and to affirm that God loves you and that God is just and merciful, patient in his judgment, and he is continued to invite us day after day for us to repent and call others into repentance, which is something that we don't do very well. Um, so we are on chapter 18. And what I will do is that I will read chapter 18. Uh, you see it in the screens. I have uh, the NIV on the left and the New Living Translation on the right. And... When I'm done, we will continue to be in prayer and then talk about verse by verse about what um, what we are drawn to, especially when chapter 17 talks about Babylon and chapter 18 talks about Babylon. And that doesn't mean that there are two Babylons. They are just different and yet the same. And we're going to talk about it. I know that that sounds confusing, but the first Babylon on chapter 17 talks about the religious Babylon with the whore, with the prostitute of Babylonia. And then chapter 18 talks from the perspective of the political and socioeconomical aspect of Babylonia. Um, so we will, we will um, digest both of them. So let us begin uh, reading um, the scripture, uh, reading Revelations 18, verse 1. New Living Translation. After all this, I saw another angel come down from heaven with great authority, and the earth grew bright with his splendor. He gave a mighty shout. Babylon is fallen. The great city is fallen. She has become a home for demons. She is a hideout for every foul, foul spirit, a hideout for every foul vulture, of every foul and dreadful animal. For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of her passionate immorality. The kings of the world have committed adultery with her because of her desires for extrava extravagant luxury. The merchants of the world have grown rich. Then I heard another voice calling from heaven. Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins, or you will be punished with her. For her sins are piled as high as heaven, and God remembers her evil deeds. Do to her as she has done to others. Double her penalty for all her evil deeds. She brew a cup of terror for others, so brew twice as much for her. She glorified herself and lived in luxury. So match it now with torment and sorrow. She boasted in her heart. I am queen on my throne. I am no helpless widow. And I have no reason to mourn. Therefore, these plagues will overtake her in a single day. Death and mourning and famine. She will be completely consumed by fire. For the Lord God who judges her is mighty. And the kings of the world who committed adultery with her and enjoy her great, her great luxury will mourn for her as they see the smoke rising from her charred remains. They will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. They will cry out, how terrible, how terrible for you, O Babylon, your great city, in a single moment, God judgment came on you. The merchants of the world will weep and mourn for her, for there is no one left to buy their goods. 
She bought great quantities of gold, silver, jewels, and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, things made of fragantine wood, ivory goods, and objects made of expensive wood and bronze and iron and marble. She also bought cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, franchise, franchise, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, wagon, and bodies, that is, human slaves. The fancy things you love so much are gone, they cry. All the luxury of splendor are gone forever, never to be yours again. The merchants who became wealthy by selling her these things will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. They will weep and cry out. How terrible, how terrible for that great city. She was clothed in fine purple and scarlet linens, decked out with gold and precious stones and pearls. In a single moment, all the wealth of the city is gone. And all the captains of the merchant ships and their passengers and sailors and crews will stand in a distance. They will cry out as they watch the smoke ascend and they will say, where is the, where, where is there another city as great as this? And they will weep and throw dust on their heads to show their grief. And they will cry out, how terrible, how terrible for that great city. The ship owners became wealthy by transporting her great wealth on the seas. In a single moment, it's all gone. Rejoice over her fate, O heaven and people of God and apostles and prophets. For at last, God has judged her for your sakes. Then mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a huge milestone. He threw it into the ocean and shouted, just like this, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down with violence and will never be found again. The sound of harps, singer, flutes, and trumpets will never be heard in you again. No craftsmen and no trades will ever be found in you again. The sound of the mill will never be heard in you again. The light of the lamp will never shine in you again. The happy voices of brides and grooms will never be heard in you again. For your merchants were the greatest in the world, and you have deceived the nations with your sorceries. In your streets flooded the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people, and the blood of the people slaughter all over the world. That's a good time in thunder right there. Man. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you. I mean, how how amazing it is that I finished reading and there is thunder like the word of God. <laughs> My friends, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and the rain and the thunder and the rain and the thunder and the rain. Thank you for the things that we don't even understand. We pray to you because we know this. You are forever faithful and merciful. Your wisdom goes beyond what we understand. Be with us as we explore your word. Help us to not only acquire more knowledge, but to practice that which we understand. To you be the glory and honor now and forever. Amen. My friends. Let us begin with chapter 18, verse 1. After all this, I saw another angel come down from heaven with great authority, and the earth grew bright with his splendor. So if you read chapter 17, you will see that another angel was coming down. Now, uh, this is where you have to understand that the book of Revelation is not chronological. Not everything that happens in chapter 17 will precede what says in chapter 18. This is taken from the concept that for God, there is no time. Time is something that is to us. You know, um, 
many scholars talk about God existence in this way. God does not exist. God does not exist as this table, as this computer, as you and me. God is not touched by that. So you cannot say that God exists. God existed in the person of Jesus Christ, but currently God does not exist because he's not bound by what we call existence. And obviously that's a mumbo jumbo big thing theologically where you says, oh, God doesn't exist. Of course it exists. You just heard him, the thunder, that's God. So God is in you and me. Yeah, exactly. So how can you say that God doesn't exist? Well, because God doesn't exist in the bubble, in the box of existence. Now, if you were to talk about physics and, you know, theory and all that, obviously you could make the argument. So that's the first thing. Don't understand chapter 17 and 18 as chronological, but as they talking about the same thing at the same time from different perspectives. One thing is true. Pay attention to the end of verse one. And the earth grew bright with his splendor. Who is his? It's not the splendor of the angel. It's the splendor of God. The angel comes from being in the presence of God. And the splendor of God it's so attractive and tangible that the person and the angel that is attached or in contact with them remain that splendor. This happened to Moses. When many of the paintings that you see of Moses, you will see that Moses doesn't have a face, but his face is radiant because Moses saw God. God called him my friend. Now, Jesus calls us our friend. But God, the creator, called Moses his friend. And so this light, you know, again, I remember this, and I've, I've mentioned this a, uh, uh, a couple times in, in sermons. There was a time where Nico was, Nico, Nico was going to the paint tree, and he was going to get a cookie. I said, Nico, where are you going? You want to get a cookie? My mama told me that I could get a, get a cookie. And, you know, his mom told him. So he was not afraid. He was just walking because he was in the confidence of the permission of the mother. So in the same way, the angel comes not from his own splendor, but from the splendor of God. There are many who say that this is Jesus in the story of chapter 18. We just don't know. Obviously, when you read chapter one and two and three, you are recognized that Jesus has splendor. And then we can make the argument that Jesus is in the Father and the Father is in Jesus and together with the Holy Spirit, they make the triumph God. So, so the angel gave a mighty shout. Babylon is fallen. The great city is fallen. She has become a home of demons, for demons. She's a hideout of every foul spirit, a hideout for every foul vulture and every foul and dreadful animal. So obviously, if you remember, Israel is known as a woman and Babylon is known as a woman as well. But they are in contrast. The woman in chapter 17 has pearls and gold. The woman, Israel, is adorned with what? The sun, the moon, the stars. So the devil will always try to mimic what God is doing, but obviously is unable to do that. Now, as we talk about this city, she has become a home for demons. What does that mean? They are comfortable. When you're at home, that means that you're, there's comfort. 
So the praise of Babylon is not just the evil that Babylon is, but it, how it provides the comfort of Babylon. So one of the biggest sins of this institution, which we're going to call Babylon, is the comfort that they provide to demons. Now, when the text talks about a hideout for every foul spirit, um, in Greek, it talks about unclean. So, for every unclean spirit, you could mimic that demons are spiritual realm type of stuff. A hideout for every foul vulture. What is a vulture? And a bird. He eats of the dead bodies. Now, a vulture doesn't kill. He eats from what is already dead. And every foul and dreadful animal. What is the author doing this? What is he describing to you? It will be ugliness. But he's telling you that this is a home. And everything in this home is conducive to grow what? Evil. The evil that lives and the evil that persists and the evil that moves. Now, obviously, they are not really talking about animals. They're talking about something worse than animals. They're talking about the passionate immorality. Now, immorality, uh, in chapter 17, they were talking a lot about sexual immorality. Now they're just talking about immorality here. And immorality, you know, nowadays, who judges what is moral and who is not? Society. In the Bible, who judges what is moral? God. So when they're talking about immorality, you need to make sure that you are familiar with what God holds as moral, not the virtues of what we assume is Christianity. I grew up in a, in a private school and uh, women had a rule that their skirts had to be an inch, an inch longer beyond their knees. That's morality. But that's according to what the standards of the school says. You know, many of you grew up in a time where you were not allowed to use pants. That's morality according to the world. So you need to be careful when you're reading the book of Revelation that you don't assume that you know what immorality is because it changes. Have you seen commercials lately? There was a commercial that I saw last night when there was a woman shaving and she's so close to her vagina that you're like, whoa, I've never seen that. And they're like getting bold and bolder and bolder. And you're like, when? I God, and that is, you know, we have not been, and he doesn't, he didn't even understand what he saw. And I'm like, dear Lord, wow. Um, and obviously they're selling a racer, you know? So that's the first thing. Now, say that again. No. Oh, yes. What are they really selling? Correct. But my, my, my urge is for you to consider what God calls righteous versus what we think is right and wrong. So we should not measure immorality according to what we believe is immoral and what is not. We should be thinking about what God holds as immorality or not. And he will tell us, the text will tell us what is immorality, according to chapter 18 of the book of Revelation. I just don't want you to assume that the immorality they're talking about is the morality that you have. Remember, 
Don't read the book of Revelation by putting yourself in the middle. Read it, putting God in the middle. Um, obviously, they're talking about wine of our passionate immorality because wine is something that you consume, something that you agree, and something that dubs your senses. You know, when people drink too much wine, they stop being themselves. The kings of the world, obviously, we're talking about who is in charge of the world, have committed adultery. So obviously, adultery means that the kings have been committed to someone else, and now they're cheating on this someone else. The kings of the world should have been committed to pursue righteousness and godliness. If you read the book of Daniel, you will know that God is the one that allows those in power to be in power with the opportunity that with great power comes a great responsibility to quote Spider-Man, so to speak. But the kings have committed adultery with her. They have played to her passionate immorality. And because of their desires for what? Extravagant luxury. This is the immorality. It's not about sexual thing, but is the craving of the luxury that many of the kings have. The gold, the power, the fame, the looking good. This is what has tricked the kings in chapter 18. Oh, yeah. Know, you want to see the movie. And then some and some of the shows that you see are so much in the reality and, and, and sex and trauma and books and sex. Yes. Um pleasant to see the movie. Yes. Um it's I wouldn't say it's getting worse. I will say it's getting more wild. They used to try to hide it, at least. Now they don't even care. Yes. Yes. But in chapter 18, what the text is talking about is luxury. Not sexual or drugs or anything like that. He's talking about how good it looks, how good it feels. Have you? What's you know, I want you to go back to the fanciest restaurant you have ever been. The fanciest, the 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 fanciest that you have ever dressed and the fanciest that you have ever eaten. Okay, so what God offers is not the luxury of that. What God offers is. I want you to think about the moment where you had a family dinner and everybody that needed to be there was there and the food was delicious and the company was spectacular. That's the difference between God and the world. The world tries to sell you the fast car, the fancy, you know, five course meal with wine and this and that and the fancy chef. But what is a fancy chef have to do against the meal of your mother or your grandmother cooking? It's nothing. You can't compare that. Which is why we have to think about the Last Supper. Do you think the Last Supper was fancy? Or do you think the Last Supper was a meal, a basic meal of bread and wine by people who love each other. The world will try to sell you luxury. God will try to tell you, sell you what? Family. The thing that makes you, you know, that is not even about the turkey anymore. It's about being there. Have you ever eaten something that is burned that somebody else cook and you think it tastes the greatest? You know? Jeez, my kid. Uh, last Thursday, I went to the hospital because of my ears. And Dante was concerned 
So he cooked me the most amazing breakfast that I would have in my life. You know what he cooked? He gave me a cookie. <laughs> he gave me a piece of candy. He gave me a slice of bread with jelly and peanut butter. Bend it. And he drew me a little note. Says, Daddy, I love you. And he put it on the top and gave it to me. Now, honestly, is that the best breakfast that I will ever have? No, it's not. But it is. But it is. Here's my six-year-old concern, and he doesn't know what to do but to cook breakfast for me. And a tall glass of water. Christianity is not about luxury. It's about purpose. It's been a blessing to hear our choir singing in the last couple of Bible studies. Let me eat you in a secret. There are better musicians and better singers out there. Right? There are. Absolutely. Famous musicians that could hit every single note right. But they don't have that spirit. We don't worship God because of how good we sound. We worship God because of how our heart sings. That's the beauty that chapter 18 is reminding us. What matters is in the spirit in which you sing, not how good you sound. It's not a performance. They have an audience of one. To God. So I will never change this group of men and women for a better choir. Why? Because of their spirit. Were you here a couple of Sundays ago when I don't even remember the song. I don't remember it. I don't remember the words that they were singing. I remember their how it felt. Man, it was so powerful. I felt that there were a thousand voices behind me. So again, Christianity is not about luxury. Babylon tried to trick you with luxury. Is a spirit. So let us continue. Then I heard another voice calling from heaven. Come away from her, my people. How is it possible that there is people of God living in Babylon? It is possible because we're humans. And some of us will be attracted to luxury. Which is not a sin that sends us straight to hell. John, 1 John chapter 5, tells you or talks to you about sins that do not kill. It's tricky. It's a rabbit hole. Because it makes a difference between this sin and this type of sin. And I don't have a good way of explaining that. But I'm telling you, chapter 4 of Revelation 18 affirms that you can be a Christian and still be tempted. And what happens? God still gives you the opportunity to repent and make sense of what's going on. You can be a good person and still be tempted. That's fine as long as you recognize and repent. And come back to the fold. Come away from her, my people. Do not take part in her sins. Meaning the luxury. Don't get attached to the luxury of it. Or you will be punished with her. Um, let's go back really quick to Genesis 19. Uh, verse 14. So Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, so Lot rushed out to tell his daughter's fiances. Okay, so a little bit of history here. So there are two guests 
there's a couple guests that come to visit Lot. They're angels. And then there's a community that wants to have sex with them. They want to rape them. They want them to participate in whatever they have going on. And Lot does what? He offers his daughters. Virgins, which is pretty horrific, but there is an explanation for that. Obviously, there is a, there was a guideline for people at the time that the people who were your guests, you had to defend them. So you can explain that to that. But anyway, that's not the point of where I was going for. Lot offers his daughters to the community. And they, they said, no, we want the angels. They, they want the people who are visiting you. And Lot says, you can't have them. But at one moment, everything wakes up and these people tell Lot there's going to be judgment upon the city. And Lot decides to tell the fiancés of those who are going to get married to his virgin daughters to get out. So that's what you see in Genesis 19, 14. So Lot rushed out to tell his daughter's fiancé, quick, get out of the city. The Lord is about to destroy it. But what did they do? But the young man thought he was only joking. At dawn the next morning, the angels became insistent. Hurry, they said a lot to Lot. Take your wife and your two daughters who are here. Get out right now or you will be swept away in the destruction of the city. This is what's happening again on Revelation 18, verse 4. And do you think that only happens once? No, it doesn't. Go to Isaiah 52. Isaiah, Isaiah 52. Verse 11. Get out, get out and leave your captivity. Get out, get out, leave your captivity where everything you touch is unclean. Does that sound familiar? Remember the description of Babylonia? Get out, out of there and purify yourself so you, so who carry home the sacred objects of the Lord. You who carry home the sacred objects of the Lord. Is this the only time it happens in Genesis and Isaiah? No. Go back to, go to Jeremiah. We're going to be taking a stroll through the whole Bible. So bear with me. Jeremiah 50, verse 8. But now flee from Babylon. Leave the land of the Babylonians like male goats at the herd of the flock. Lead my people home again. Not only that, but now pay attention to Jeremiah 51. 51.45. Come out, my people, free from Babylon. Save yourself. Run from the Lord's fierce anger. And then you can check 2 Corinthians. Second Corinthians six fourteen. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? It doesn't you it doesn't tell you to get out, but if you're in Babylonia. And Babylon is the pit of everything that is bad and unclean. It tells you, wake up. You cannot be here. So, when there is a nudging inside of you, and you know what's going on, it's not your scene. Whether it's drinking or partying, or even a conversation of gossip. 
what does revelation tell you? Identify, excuse yourself, and get out. You don't have to stay there fighting them. Just get out sometimes. If you recognize that you don't belong in one place, get out. Recognizing that you don't belong. And you can walk away. And I have, I have walked away from friendships. I have allowed them to walk away from me. Because if they are not a benefit, what are they? They are just holding me down, holding me back from what I could be. Last but not least, Ephesians, Ephesians 5, verse 11. Take no part in the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. It is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret, sadly or not sadly, but to wake up, they are not even doing them in secret anymore. They are out there. We are allowing our leaders to not represent us in that way. So, and I could go on and on and on and on about what is the call of Revelations 18 for you to recognize that when you belong to God, the expectation is that you will pay attention to the spirit that lives within you and that you will wake up to the reality that sometimes you cannot fix it. Sometimes you need to walk away. And it's a challenge to know when to tell the difference. As a pastor, sometimes I put myself in situations where I want to bring the good news of the gospel to those who are lost. And sometimes I need to know when I have no business getting into a situation. Verse 5, Revelation 18, for her sins, Babylon's sins, are piled as high as heaven, and God remembers her evil deeds. We're talking about also Genesis here in Babylon, the Tower of, ba of Babel, how they were building on, on sins. Do to her as she has done to others. Double her penalty. Greek says, give her an equal penalty. For all her evil deeds, she brew a cup of terror for others, so brew twice as much for her. This is a harsh judgment. What is the evil deed of Babylon? Remember what we talked about in the first one? to house evil. It's not that they were just doing evil. They were breathing, brewing evil. And if we, if, we re if we learn anything on chapter 17 of Revelations, what happens to the prostitute? She gets devoured by the beast at the end. Even if the beast, when the beast was dormant, and was supporting the, the prostitute. At the end, the beast is the beast. And it will devour those who serve the beast. Have you heard the story of the frog and the scorpion? There's a time a scorpion is drowning. And there is a frog nearby. And the frog says, I'm going to help you, scorpion. So this frog swims next to the scorpion and allows the scorpion to, you know, to be on top of the frog. As the frog is swimming to the shore, the scorpion bites, stings the frog. 
And as the frog can no longer move, says, why would you do that? Don't you know that if I drown, you drown as well? And the scorpion says, I cannot help it. I'm a scorpion. There's people like that. There's people like that. Scorpion is a scorpion. Again, we are reminded what the theme of verse chapter 18 is. She, Babylon, glorified herself and lived in luxury. So match it now with torment and sorrow. Now this is the judgment that verse seven was, verse six was talking about. She boasted in her heart, I am queen on my throne. I am no helpless widow. I have no reason to mourn. Chapter 17 tells you that, not chapter 17, I'm sorry, but the Bible tells us that we have to be paying attention to what? James 1, we just read it uh, on Sunday, tells you that the mark of true religion is the care of orphans and widows. And for you not to be what? To be matched to this broken world. See how the Bible works together. The Bible is not telling you two different messages. It's the same thing. Don't try to live a life of luxury. Pay attention to the spirit in which things are given. For Babylon to say, I'm a, I am queen on my throne, is blasphemy. Because Babylon cannot be in the throne. Who belongs in the throne? Chapter 1 of Revelation 2 and 3. God. I am no helpless widow. Well, I'm sorry. If you're not a helpless widow, God didn't come for you. The, the, the will, helpless widow has nothing to do with being actually a widow. It has to be with someone that depends on someone else to survive. I have no reason to mourn. We all do. As Christians, we all have a reason to mourn. Even if it's just the death of our Lord. To say that you don't have something to complain about and you don't need help and that you pull yourself from your bootstrings is unfaithful. We all depend on Christ. Therefore, the plagues will overtake her in a single day, death and mourning and famine. She will be completely consumed by fire for the Lord God who judges her is mighty. And the kings of the world who committed adultery with her, again, has nothing to do with sex. It has everything to do be in bed with. You know, one of the dangers of sharing a bed with someone that is not equally to commit it to the light with you is that it will corrupt you. Having sex is an intimate thing that should be treasured and shared with someone that has the longevity with you and has someone that believes at the core system with you. Sadly, in our current days, we give our precious possession easy and we share it with anybody. And so we think, why are we so broken sometimes? Because we don't treasure that which should be treasure. To be intimate with somebody should be treasure. Sadly, people have minimized the impact of their sexuality. And enjoy her great luxury will mourn for her as they see smoke rising from her charred remains. In the story of Lot, Lot goes with his daughters and his wife. And as they're reaching out, who turns back? The wife. And what happens to her? It gets frozen and gets salt all over. Why? Because she 
She left Sodom and Gomorrah, but she didn't leave it behind. They will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. And this is a big change of language now from chapter 17 and chapter 18. Because in chapter 17, nobody cries for the prostitute for the whore of Babylon. Nobody cries for her. In this moment, now they're showing that there is not only the kings were in bed with Babylon, now they are missing that. This is a great sin. They will stand at a distance, terrified by her great torment. They will cry out, how terrible, how terrible for you, O oh great, O oh Babylon, you great city. In a single moment, God's judge came on you. Now, this is another. It's not only the king's politics. Now, the economy, the merchants. If chapter 17 was grieving over re the religious institution that will betray God, if you remember, Jesus fought the bees and won against the bees by himself because every institution in the world that was religious walked away from Jesus. That's a prophecy from chapter 17. In chapter 18, it says that the political power and the economy power and social uh, establishment of the world will walk away also from God. And the merchants of the world would weep and mourn for her, for there is no one left to buy their goods. And what is the power of the beast? What is the symbol? What allows you to do? To buy and to sell goods. So the Bible tells us that people will give up their soul for the power to be comfortable in luxury and to be able to purchase and sell things. How cheap do we give out away our lives? She bought great quantities of gold. We're talking about Babylonian. Silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple silk. What do you think this list is showing to us? It's not word by word what is missing. But it is the intimate knowledge that they knew who Roman was. Who Rome was when John received this prophecy. This is one of those things where you shouldn't be taking literal because there are comforts now that have nothing to do with this I mean how expensive is objects made of expensive wood yeah sure you can buy a chair for $20,000 so think beyond that the scripture we're talking about is the camaraderie, the luxury that people want to live in. She also bought cinnamon, spice, incense, mirror, anthracite, frankincense, wine, oil, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, wagons, and bodies. That is human slaves. Talks again about the yeah living in luxury. Having slaves, it was a luxury. Horses and wagons. You know, having a wagon in time of Rome was a luxury. A wagon is nothing right now. But I'm sure you can make sense of it. Oh, I went away. Here's the thing. The fancy things you love so much are gone. 
they cry. All your luxuries and splendor are gone forever, never to be yours again. This comes from punishment. Why? Again, because Christianity, our hope in our Lord, is not about the material things. And I, remind, and I remind you that we talk about heaven like what? How do we describe heaven? Streets made of what? Gold and water like blister. And don't pay attention. I'm telling you, you are not going to see gold streets. That's not it. It's going to be something beautiful. But don't expect 24 karat gold on the streets. It's something that moves your imagination. Not that technically is what's going to be seen. The luxury is the problem. Christians, and I'm guilty of this as well, sometimes we say, oh, what a blessing. I was able to buy a new car. How little we think about blessing is. A new car, a blessing. Oh, so God bless you with a new car. So God gave you a new car. So God loves you because he gave you a new car, right? Oh, so God doesn't love you because you didn't get a new car. So be careful equating personal luxury and gain as a blessing. Not everything that is new and fancy comes from God. Not everything that is good and fancy is evil either. Just don't attach God blessing and material things. Here's a big example for those who are teachers. What's the problem with a kid that shows up after a Christmas bag says, oh, Santa came to my house and I got a PlayStation 5 and a new iPad. And the kid next door says, oh, Santa didn't bring me that. Santa brought me clothes and a new pair of shoes. See the problem? And obviously we're just talking about Santa and the kid can get over it. But when you're telling someone, God bless me with an amazing job, and you have the other Christian saying, oh, well, God hasn't blessed me with that. See the problem? Equating and moving luxury as a gift from God is problematic at best. Be careful. Be careful when you are boasting or sharing much. Now, all things that are good come from God. But isn't that it is not about luxury. So what I will tell you is not, not do it or do it. I'm saying, let us be careful doing two plus two with blessings and material things and faith because it's not going to give you four. Not quite sure that I understand what you're trying to say, but let me complement what I just said earlier with this. God blesses you so that you can, in turn, give that blessing to others and share that blessing with others. Think about Jesus feeding the 5,000. God blesses the world through someone who gave what they had. These people, the child who brought the loaves of bread and the fish, they had a blessing of food. And they brought the blessing to whom? Jesus. And what did Jesus do? He took it 
and he gave thanks for it. So it's a physical thing, right? And then he broke it and shared it and it multiplied. For the sake of whom? Of the owner who gave it? No. To the world. So God blesses us with the purpose that we will bless others through it. And in return, God will bless us even more. They're not. It is included, but it's not the only one. Um, I heard someone said something like, the beginning of all blessings is to count your blessings. You begin to be blessed by acknowledging how blessed you have been already. The attitudes of people are a blessing. But being optimist sometimes is just a mind thing. I prefer now, since the summer, to be said that I am a possibilist. I see possibilities in light of God. I'm not an optimist. I'm a possibilist. I see the possibilities because of the power of God. Attitudes, positive attitudes are great. But positive, positive attitudes with a broken heart, with a broken arm are nothing. You cannot have a broken arm and think that positive thinking will heal that broken arm, right? Can positive attitudes will go so far, right? So, um, blessings can be physical, can be about money. The fact that we wake up every single day is a blessing. The fact that we can be here. In peace is a blessing. The fact that we have the freedom that we have is a luxury. But we need to use that freedom and that peace for the purposes of the kingdom of God. The problem with Babylonia is that they were using the luxury for themselves. And that's a challenge for us. Can you use your blessings, whatever they may be, to bless and for the sake of others? It is a challenge. Now, Caroline, help me understand what were you trying to ask? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my father, my first father, the same thing with me, the same thing people who are in the And the plus side, I don't have to do Work and being people and the students and students are amazing to work with and what to do things. Yeah. In my eyes, I see that as being on the blessing. I Yeah, it is. It is. Absolutely. So don't don't let me tell you that walking away from a bad situation and jumping into a new, better situation is not a blessing because it is. 
It is. Absolutely. Correct. It is. Absolutely. God wants you to have a purposeful, fruitful, happy life. God loves you. God wants you to have a fulfilling job. Even God cares for the ox. God tells us in the scriptures that you should not tie the mouth of the ox, that he should be able to eat while he works on the fields. Yes, but let me let me finish with that. Now, the trick is for you not to think that God made that person fire you to bless you. It's God is not moving the strings of life, pulling strings. It's, oh, Caroline now is going to church. So I'm going to bless her. Oh, Caroline didn't show up to church. So I'm going to cut the string and she's going to get fired. I'm going to make her suffer. That's not the reality. So what I will advise against is thinking about the quid pro quo of faith. Does that make sense? Robbie, make sense? No? All right. The quick pro quo means you do something for me and I'll do something for you. You scratch my bag and I scratch yours. The blessings from God dot com from you being faithful to God. God blesses you even before you were faithful. God blesses you even you are sinner. But in response to his love, sometimes we're responding faithfulness. To think that life is just a series of blessings and misfortunes is wrong. The Bible tells us also that we need to learn to live in all times, in good and bad. So in your example, you are to pray to God in the midst of a challenging time because God already blessed you. And in the fortune that you found a job that you love, you should also give thanks. Give thanks in all moments, not only when you feel you're blessed. Pray not for an easy life, pray for a purposeful life. Don't think that simply because you show up to Bible study and pray and you go to church means that God is going to bless you more. That's not how it works. God blesses you because he blesses you, not because of what you do. And then you say, well, if God is going to bless everyone, no matter what they do, what's the point? Right? If you show up to church, if you pray, if you read the Bible, if you behave morally, if you do good things, if you help orphans and widows, and if God blesses the other people that are not doing what you're doing, so what's the point? That's the struggle where we are. Mm -hmm. it's a blessing you should say it's a blessing mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So here's, again, trying to bring it back because I know we're going into some rabbit holes here. Blessing is not a mathematical equation that you have to do this to get these results. That's not how life works, according to God. What God wants you to understand is that you should not be tempted by a life of luxury and easy glorious life that's a trick from babylon don't equate blessing with the presence of god 
Don't think that God is punishing you when you're having cancer. Don't think that God is punishing you when you're sick. But find God in those moments, despite the circumstances. And in return, God, who is faithful, just will reward you. But you don't do it because of the reward. It's like this. Do you believe in Christ so that you can avoid going to hell? Is that it? Is that the whole purpose of our Christianity? Is it we just want to avoid hell so we go to church? And do you know that many Christians do that or think that? Well, I don't want to go to hell, so I, I want to go to church. It's not like that. Transactions don't work like that. Deeper. When you are a grandparent, when you're a parent, should you do good things for your kids only because they are your kids? All right. How many of you care for a neighborhood kid like it was their like your own, even though they were not your own? Why? Because that's what love is. Love just pours out. And when it pours out, you cannot control it. So you don't love people. How easy is to love the people that love you? Very easy. Which is why the trick and the test of Christianity is not loving Jesus. I said it last week. It is loving Judas. That's the trick and the test of Christianity. Can you love Judas? Do you believe that if Judas would have not taken his life, do you think that Jesus would have forgiven him? That's the test of Christianity. If only Judas would have believed that Christ would have forgiven him. Judas repented. Judas returned the money. Judas says, no, no, don't do this. He said, he said, yeah, he did. No, well, he, there was no way he would have returned it to Jesus because Jesus was being killed. What I'm saying is that Judas tried to make amends. But he didn't trust the grace of God. And so he took his life. Before he was able to experience the grace of God. I believe in my heart that if Judas would have been with a penitent heart and repent. And I know that. Why? Because that's what happened to Peter. How many times Peter betrayed Jesus or denied Jesus? Three times. And how many Jesus, How many times did Jesus make Peter affirm that he believed in Christ? Three times. Did he do it for the sake of Jesus? I don't think so. He did it for the sake of Peter. Peter, do you love me? Yes. And what did he say? Repent. No, he didn't say that. What did he say? Feed my, feed my sheep. Care for my sheep. So again, I'm telling you, it's not even about Jesus. Jesus didn't even want Peter to repent about Jesus. Jesus wanted to say, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Then feed my lamb. And Jesus, uh, Peter was actually upset, right? Why do you keep asking me the same thing? He said, care for you. How amazing is that? The opportunity to repent is a blessing. But many Christians stuck, are stuck in the luxury of Babylon. They think that Christianity is perceived by power, by fame, by luxury. God loves me, so I'm blessed. It's nothing new. In the Bible, they believe that when you were blind or couldn't walk. You were a sinner. You have been faithful, unfaithful. Something that Christians still believe on this day. Now we're running out of time. Oh, my gosh. Jeez. Sorry, guys. Let me, uh, there's a lot of things to take from here. Uh, where was the other thing? 
Oh, verse 21. This is something significant on chapter uh, on chapter 18. The mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a huge milestone. He threw it into the ocean and shouted, just like this, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down with violence and will never be found again. Go to Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 6. But if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to fall into sin, it will be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. It's the same thing that chapter 18 of Revelation is talking. Babylon deserves to be drown in this way because what's the sin of Babylon to house to ferment to to support evil and to trick children of God with luxury with fame with power and to trick them so what is their judgment because God is faithful and just God will fulfill his judgment. And so when you're asking, when you see pictures of chapter 18, of uh, 1821, you will see a meteor coming down to heaven. That's a picture that they have put. You can make sense of what it was. But this is where it comes from. So he's a reminder. We read the book of Revelation a lot to see the end of things, right? But I have shown you today, everything that you find in the book of Revelation has been shared with us in the New and the Old Testament. Nothing in the book of Revelation is new. It's just the affirmation of what the Bible tells us. God is patient. God is kind. God is just. Eventually, those who did evil will pay the price. And those who remain faithful despite the adversities will be rewarded by not things, but by being an eternity with the presence of God. Yeah. And that's what God is doing all through the Bible. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Verse 22, verse 23, and verse 24, it repeats the music. Babylon will be so punished. Verse 22 tells you that the mu music of the harpists and musicians, pipers and trumpets, will never be heard again in you. No worker or any trade, the sound of milestone will never be heard in you again. The light of the lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride will never be heard in you again. The merchants were the world's important people. Your magic spelled and all the nations led astray. Verse 24 is very significant. This is, let me finish with this. Revelation 18, last verse. In your streets flow the blood of the prophets and of God's holy people and the blood of people slaughter all over the world. God will judge this world for the people who were just and still pay the price. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you're going to have an easy life. You know, I just saw this thing in the picture says, God is not like an epidural that will take the pain of the world. You know, when you're giving birth and they put an epidural and you get high and, you know, you don't feel the pain and all that. 
Epidurals are a great miracle. They're a blessing. I have seen them in work. But God is not an epidural. God is like a midwife who will sit by your side and walk you through it with you. So, my friends, don't pray for an easy life. Pray for a purposeful life. Don't think that blessings are only about you. When you receive a blessing, the best way to be faithful with a blessing is to share the blessing with others. Don't pray for an easy life. Pray for a purposeful life. My friends, that's all I got for today. Sorry, we cannot do the homework. I get chatting. So uh, see you next week.